everybody. Happy Tuesday. I can't believe it's only Tuesday. It seems like so much has happened. Uh, it's the first stream of the week, and you know what that means. I'm going to gift some memberships. I see some people have already been quite generous. Jerry, thank you for gifting. Oh, you get, Jerry gifted 20 memberships overall. That's extremely kind of you, Jerry. Thank you so much. And now here I go. I'm going to gift, uh, I'm going to gift some as well. Hold on. I had to go and get my uh, credit card because I, I needed the, uh, again, as I said, I need the, um, the security code. Membership gifting. Here we go. Five memberships. Huzzah! Oh, thank you, Ross. Thank you for gifting some memberships as well. Uh, so I, I think I applaud your guys' generosity, and I'm glad that I'm uh, finally uh, able to uh, to participate as well. Oh, look, Smart Girl, just uh, Smart Girl, so nice to see you. Oh, look at you guys. You guys are all great. Uh, all right, so this is quite the live stream today. We have some very interesting stories to discuss. Uh, so thank you for joining. And we're going to have a great time. Oh, thanks. I'm glad you like my shirt, Lucas. I was filming my Guardians of the Galaxy spoiler review uh, before, we, uh, before we got started. Uh, so the way this works, as usual, is that please, because uh, I have such complicated things to discuss today. Oh, thank you, James. Thank you for your generosity. Uh, because uh, these are such complex things to discuss today, uh, please hold your comments and questions until the end of each section when I ask you to open, I open it up to questions and comments. And then at the very end, there will be a Q&A where you can ask me about anything. All right. I got the thumb holes. I love this shirt. Oh, yeah. All right. So writer's strike. I got, I got visuals. We're going to have a great time. All right. So story number one. Boop. The writer's strike. Oh, my goodness. It's happening. So, very interesting. Um, let me bring up the first. I have uh, uh, all these images here. So this is the when the writers, uh, uh, last night, uh, they said they were indeed striking. And they were like, oh, the other studios are so mean. They won't give us what we want. But I was speaking to a friend of mine who's in the Writers Guild on Friday. And uh, he made a very interesting comment. He told me that, in fact, a number of the studios want a strike because every contract has a force majeure clause that under extraordinary circumstances, uh, the contract can be voided. So guess what counts as an extraordinary circumstance? A writer's strike. So, uh, you know, some people had said that Netflix was particularly aggressive uh, in not being willing to go to the negotiating table. And I bet you Netflix has a lot of contracts they'd like to get rid of. Uh, the way it works in uh, the writing world is that you only get paid once you deliver. So don't count. So even if you sign a deal to be paid X number of dollars for some kind of script or, you know, for a movie or, or, or a show, you don't actually get paid until you deliver it. So, uh, and sometimes they'll renegotiate at a lower price or sometimes they'll just walk away. Uh, with, that's what they did with the last uh, writer's strike. So I think you're gonna see a lot of deals be killed. You might not even hear about it in the press, uh, but I think that's uh, very interesting. And that's one of the reasons that I think the strike happened. Uh, we, uh, it's expected to last quite long because it's uh, over such serious stuff and so much money is being fought over. But that's one of the reasons that the strike was most definitely going to happen. Uh, all right, so what this means, I have, let me see what's my next image here. All right, so we're going to talk about salaries in a moment. Because I saw some people say, oh, hey, you know, why should we feel sorry for writers? So doesn't everybody in Hollywood make a lot of money? Well, I'll explain that to you. All right, so, so you know, uh, Toon Dude 19 says, does Gunn have to stop writing Superman? Well, he has to stop writing anything that anyone can prove. Like, for instance, today, the Writers Guild said, tell your agents not to book any gigs for you or try to even get you any writing gigs going forward for once the strike is done. And I saw someone in the comments say, uh, I got dropped by my agency last time I did that, you know, like the last writer's strike. I don't see people doing that. I think that's a little bit too aggressive. So I think you might see a little fiddling, you know, uh, like uh, the late night talk shows can't go on the air. Some of you pointed out Saturday Night Live can't air this Saturday, I don't believe. 
Uh, but anything, you know, like who's going to know if some writer, any writer, James Gunn or anybody, does a few tweaks. The real issue, though, is someone going to cross the picket line. Will someone cross the picket line to begin filming or do pre-production on Superman Legacy or any project? Because, you know, it's, there's going to be a domino effect where all the other guilds are going to strike. All the contracts are coming up at the same time in quick succession. So if the directors cross the writer's picket line, then the writers aren't going to support the directors when they go on strike. Uh, everybody's probably going to go on strike because everybody's getting hit hard by streaming. Uh, it's all an issue about streaming, taking away the money, not just money, but also the number of days that you're, you have to work. So, uh, and also there's discovered there's no money in streaming anyway. So, you know, as I told you, it's like the Mickey Mouse, you know, trying to slice the bean and, every, you know, being like, ah, oh, there's not that much bean here, man. You know, I can't give you anymore. Uh, you know, I think being paid, I think paying a la carte was obviously a lot more lucrative uh, and there was a lot more uh, money to go around. So it's really bad. I mean, as Mika pointed out, they're asking for transparency with ratings and viewership, but that doesn't equate money. You're still splitting a very small, when you think about how many people want a piece of that, fee, right? Uh, I think it's real, streaming is creating a real problem for the way the industry works. All right, so some people were like, hey, man, why should I feel bad for anyone who works in Hollywood? Well, I want to tell you something about Hollywood. Hollywood sells itself as a place that pays the big bucks, but the majority of people, I remember once when I was growing up, there was a woman in my building, uh, my family's building, whose husband worked for NBC, and they actually, he ended up quitting and uh, working in another industry and moving to the middle of the country from New York City, because, and she had said, she had told my mother and said, I don't know why everybody thinks the entertainment industry is so lucrative. Most people are paid very little, and it's almost impossible to be able to live in the cities where the entertainment industry is based, New York and Los Angeles, on the salaries that are paid. Uh, so, and also, uh, when you're talking about creatives like writers, they don't work every day. They don't work every week. They only work for a partial amount of time. So there was a very good tweet going around that I really liked, so I, I screenshotted it to share with you. And this person broke down what a screenwriter gets paid. So most people are staff writers. I mean, like, consider how many people are in the Writers Guild and how many people write a movie, right? So staff writer works for maybe, say, they said nine weeks at $5,000 a week. So that's $45,000 for the gig. Then they have to pay 20% to the agent and the manager. So that's 9 k right off the top they have to pay to that. Then they have to pay the Writers Guild dues who's negotiating this deal. That's $675. Then they have to pay their taxes, which is 20%, another 9 k uh, Look how much is being taken off here. So that means they have $26,000 at the end of the day to take home. And it could be, as this person says, 6 to 12 to maybe more months before they get another job. Uh, and so they do not have enough money to cover their expenses without those residuals that would be coming in. Uh, you know, that's how people have survived in Hollywood between gigs and until they get that sweet gig that makes them a ton of money. Uh, and then this person responded, Leonard Chang, and said, you know, you also have to pay a lawyer, which is an additional 5%. And sometimes you have a business manager. And then also if you're single, you pay more taxes. So that's even less money that you're taking home. And I, so I thought that was very good to break that down. I think a lot of people have a misconception about what it's like to live in Hollywood. So I'm glad that people were making that clear. Uh, then I loved this. A friend of mine uh, in the Writers Guild sent me this tweet that someone put out there, and I thought that was fantastic. The Shield put FX on the map. Mad Men put AMC on the map. House of Cards put Netflix on the map. Writers did that, not CEOs. And then someone said, and then the person finishes, you know what you get when you have CEOs in creative lanes? You get Quibi. I thought that was great. And I thought it was funny, by the way. You can see with the, the things that they have, the, the writer's strike, picket signs, they left room for them to write stuff, which I thought was fantastic. Although it puts a lot of pressure on the writer. You know, if you're watching the picket line, you might be like, ah, maybe you shouldn't be working. <laughs> That's the best you could come up with, man. Uh, but then look what that person wrote. That person wrote, writers made Zaslav rich. Because look at how much executives are taking. This isn't just something that's happening in the tech sector. This is something that's happening in Hollywood as well. You're getting huge bonuses. Look at AMC. AMC was on the verge of declaring bankruptcy and is still struggling. Yet the uh, CEO of AMC just got like tens of millions of dollars as a bonus. 
Uh, and yet, you know, writers can't even make ends meet. Uh, and, you know, Zaslav is particularly aggressive with canceling residuals by taking shows off of the streaming service. So I thought that was really, really a strong point. So let's go back to our images here. What's next? All right, so... Uh, so I also, I think, and also you can see with some of the latest productions that have come out, we're like, boy, this writing is awful. Like, look at some of the Marvel movies. Writers are crucial to the success of the film industry. So what are they striking about? Well, well they have a list of demands that they put out. Here it is. We'll make it really big so you can see it. Sorry, see you later. All right. So these are the, the, the Writers Guild put this out. All right. And they said status of, as of May 1st. So on the left, you have the Writers Guild proposals, and on the right, you have what they say all the studios responded to, all right? So some of this stuff's a little bit too inside baseball, but we'll go over the broad strokes. So they want an increase in residual bases, and so uh, there's an argument over percentage points. Uh, then they want to, then they're arguing, so now some of you, that's one of the things they've been arguing about is uh, the amount of time and the amount of people who work on a show. And this deals with not only guaranteed pay, uh, like, you know, if you're only being paid less for less days, it, you know, imagine you, imagine you don't even get the nine weeks. So that's problematic. Then uh, a lot of writers aren't being allowed to be on production. And, you know, I think, I believe, I'm not quite sure who it was, but somebody uh, who's very high up in the industry made a good point that said, there's no learning curve. If you kick the writers off of production, they're not going to learn anything. Um, and then you're not going to be able to have showrunners down the line because that's you learn on the job. And so that's very important. So you're depriving not only people of uh, their livelihood, but of the experience to get better at the job that you need them to be better at. So I thought that was an excellent point. You know, nobody cares about tomorrow. I mean, just look at how we're handling the environment. Oh, it was a unicorn. I guess that's what my shirt is today. Ah, unicorn flying by. All right. People are like, no, I'm not going to have to deal with it. Uh, all right, then, uh, so they have, uh, they have established minimums for streaming. Uh, you know, streaming is really making, a, you know, streaming is making up their own rules as they go along, and I think uh, the, they have a problem with that. So you're seeing something about episodic television, pre-greenlit rooms. They're saying these are called, uh, they're saying these are called mini rooms, uh, and they're set up before a show definitely goes to series, and they're understaffed and underpaid. Uh, so they want to they want to put uh, they want to demand certain uh, numbers of hires and salaries. Uh, then you can say duration of employment. You know they're they're arguing that you must keep half of them. This is very crucial here. Half of the minimum staff must be employed through production. Sure, that's expensive, but what if you want some rewrites? What, you know, and again, you're training staff to eventually be showrunners. Uh, I think this is probably one of the reasons that Disney Plus shows are so bad. They're hiring all these inexperienced people. Uh, then, uh, one writer through post, I probably wouldn't agree to that. I'd be like, learn it on your own time, man. Uh, all right, you know, get a mentor. I'm not paying for that because I don't need any rewrites and post. I guess maybe if you have to do some stuff. All right. Then TV weeklies, you're seeing, uh, some, uh, some changes there as well. And then there's, hold on, there's another page. There's another page. Here we go. All right. Then page two, two pages of demands. What? <laughs> All right. Uh, then they have some compensation issues here. Then streaming. Uh, then they said, you know, uh, you have to say, you know, some of it's based on subscriber count for foreign services. And then here they want viewership numbers given. But I'm like, what's that going to do? Uh, then they have something about uh, ad supported uh, free streaming services. They want to talk about some residuals there. Pension and health, always important. But then here, here's a big one. This is also a big one. Artificial intelligence. This is crucial. You see it there in the middle? Uh, they say you have to regulate use of artificial intelligence on, uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure what MBA stands for, uh, covered projects. AI, th this is crucial. AI can't write or rewrite literary material. How would you feel? Isn't that fascinating? How would you feel if an AI rewrote your script? That would be just, I think, so horrible. Uh, all right. Uh, and can't be used as source material. And uh, I guess this material can't be used. Oh, this is brilliant. You can't use our writing to train AI to write like us. Oh, whoever came up with that is brilliant. That's very crucial. That's very, very important. Don't feed my, oh, minimum basic agreement. Thank you, Mika. Don't feed my scripts into the machine, man. Don't feed my scripts into the machine. So I think that's really smart. 
And then they have a couple tentative agreements about minimums and stuff like that. And then they said the cost. So here's the reason it's taking so long. The Writers Guild proposals would gain writers approximately $420 million per year. <laughs> uh, while as the other side is approximately an increase of $86 million, 48% of which is from minimums increase. Uh, that's ridiculous. That's like there is a lot of ground to cover there, as you can see. Uh, we'll see what they decide. Um, I think it's going to be a long strike. I think it's going to be a really long strike. Uh, and I think that they're not going to get everything that they're asking for, but I think they're really going to stick on the residuals. I think they're going to stick on the min some of the minimums of hiring. And then I think artificial intelligence is going to be a real... But, you know, if, if they don't fight for this now, they are going to put writing out of a job. And I, I got to tell you, I just don't think... Art I don't know. Let's see. Artificial intelligence is very scary. I don't know why everybody's so in favor of AI, you know? Um, you're just going to make one dude's going to be paid to enter the stuff into the machine. Uh, and it's not going to be very much by the way, um, until maybe AI can do it, you know? Uh, and, um, you know, and then, you know, who, how are you going to, how are all these people going to make a living and what are they going to do with themselves? Uh, Bartleby the Scrivener says, Hey Grace, do you remember the last writer's strike that happened and how it crushed shows like Heroes? If they strike again, do you think we'll have an even bigger impact in the streaming era? Well, let's see. I mean, Heroes, that was network television, and network television doesn't really exist anymore. And also, thankfully, this is happening at the beginning of the summer, and most network television is on a break now. All, this, all the finales are coming up, and they're ready to air. I think that the real issue is it will delay the fall schedule. You might not have the network series in the fall be able to premiere in September like when they usually do. They might be, they, you know, depending on how long the strike takes, they might not debut until like the middle of the, of the uh, you know, the very, maybe like December, the very end of the year. But yeah, I mean, like what you're heading towards here with artificial intelligence is that people won't be paid anything. They won't have jobs. They'll get a universal income, which barely allows them to make ends meet, and they'll just be turned into Wally -E type consumers. And I just think that's horrible. Uh, and I don't understand why everybody's letting it happen. Uh, Hans Hasno says, I don't get why people act like using AI to replace artistic jobs is somehow a good thing. It's the complete opposite, opposite of what AI is meant to achieve. Uh, I have a real problem with artificial intelligence. I just think, you know, that's somebody's job. I feel very strongly about it. Uh, so let's see. Let's see what happens. Randy says, have you seen Dr. Horrible Sing Along? That was made during last year's writer's strike. I don't know. I would, feel that would, I would feel that would be breaking the strike, quite frankly, unless they'd already written it. But I think filming it would be, I mean, I don't know if people would feel that way anymore. I think back then, uh, social media and YouTube was like this new thing, but now it's so professionalized. People would be like, you've crossed the picket line. Never crossed the picket line. Uh, so we'll see how, how long. I saw some people saying, hey, man, why, isn't this, why didn't this happen during the pandemic when everything was already shut down? Well, this stuff happens when the contracts have to be renewed, and this is when they're up. Uh, there is a little bit of a backlog of content, so I think that's creating a little bit of a cushion. So that's good. Hey, Dancing Dog 60, thanks for the generosity there. Uh, and then also we'll see what the domino effect is. We'll see if DGA strikes. We'll see if, uh, you know, the, you know, uh, the production people's, you know, Yahtzee, if they strike, they cover like so much stuff. And also we'll see what's done under the table. You know, I think there will be some cheating, uh, but, you know, the longer this goes on, the more conspicuous I think said cheating would be. Uh, Dan says, could you clarify? So let's do questions now. If you have any questions about the writer's strike in particular, now is the time before we move on to Fantastic Four. Dan says, could you clarify how this works with international productions or say if writers are UK-based for an American production or vice versa, et cetera? Well, if that UK writer expects to be protected by the uh, Writers Guild, and I'm sure they do because they're working in Hollywood, uh, they cannot cross the picket line. Mika says, what about shows that don't have writers' rooms? David E. Kelly and Tyler Taylor Sheridan write entire seasons themselves, but they still would be crossing the picket Well, I... I think that um, they don't have a writer's room, so those things wouldn't apply to them. Let's see here. Ta uh, ta ta Talon says, how long until AI CEO emerges? Then will they take it seriously? <laughs> That's a great one, Talon. Uh, I don't think there would ever be an AI CEO. Uh, maybe there would be, but not any time these CEOs will be alive. 
Uh, Kareem says, no, they picked the best time to strike. If it goes on too long, the fall lineup is going to get hurt on. But how many people still watch network TV? Although they're starting to go back to network TV because, uh, you know, streaming is, again, not lucrative. Honest says, I wonder if the writer's strike will make room for smaller movie shows that have been already been written but haven't been picked up. No, they can't even make a deal, supposedly. Uh, no, I don't think that will work. The thing it'll help is things that don't fall under the Writers Guild. Animation, actually, interestingly enough, is not under the Writers Guild. Reality TV isn't under the Writers Guild. Those things can continue. Cosmic says, AI needs oversight. It needs to be regulated. I'm glad writers are taking a stand against this. If we don't do this now, it's going to be done to us later. Epic Tony Stark quote. That's right, even Tony Stark didn't totally like AI. and He invented it to some degree. That's right, A.J. Jones. Last writer's strike did bring about the tidal wave of low-quality reality TV. Uh, but maybe some of it will be good. I don't know. Some people like that stuff, I guess. You know? I mean, like, Discovery is totally built on that. <laughs> uh, like, Discovery Plus is an entire thing. I guess it doesn't have a writer in sight. Kenneth says, so technically a writer could write something, but just can't turn it in until after the strike. Well, I don't really know if I would risk it because people might be like, when did you write that, Bob? And Bob would have to be a really good actor and liar and be like, oh, a long time ago, I dusted it off and sold it right when the strike was done. Uh, I mean, also, they're expecting you to be on the picket line. They're going on picket lines so that nobody crosses them. There's a whole list in the trades of when you should go to a picket line. They're going to march up and down with their cleverly written signs and say, F you, everybody. Uh, and don't you dare cross that picket line. I see you, director. I see you. Uh, Dancing Duck 60 says, can studios use old scripts and redoctor them? Well, yeah, it was funny. The, um, the Writers Guild told all the writers to demand that the studios return all their scripts that were unproduced to them <laughs> and delete them off their hard drives. And everybody was like, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. They're not going to do that. Uh, let's see here. I shall meet you at the monorail. Great name. Says the Supreme Court is hearing a case that could take the federal government's ability, oh, take it away to regulate this. Well, that seems stupid. You can't not, you can't have unregulated artificial intelligence. Bubbles Emporium says, is there anything other people can do to support this strike? Well, I guess on social media, I guess what you can do is not complain when there's not good content, right? I mean, we've been complaining that the writing sucks, so I think we really should support the writers. You know, a lot of people at the Met Gala were doing interviews, and they were like, you know, Jimmy Fallon, I think very nicely said, I wouldn't have a show if it weren't for my writing team. Uh, and so he's like, of course I support them. And I think that the Writers Guild is asking for pretty reasonable things, quite frankly. Uh, and I think that what they're asking for is really an issue for everyone. It's not like, oh, that's just a writer's problem. It's an everyone problem. As they said in Avatar 2, it might not be your problem today, but it will be tomorrow if you don't stop it now. Uh, Leroy says, is there only one guild? Nope, there are multiple guilds. Oh, there's only one writer's guild. There's only one writer's guild, because then you can't have competing guilds. That would defeat the point. Jay Shrumple Stiltskin says, what do you think about studios stockpiling scripts? Well, good luck getting people to cross the picket line again. I think that's tough. Um, Britt says, uh, should actors get involved? Well, I think they will through not crossing the picket line and voicing their support. Amanda Seyfried on the red carpet last night also was very supportive of writers. That's right. That's easy for you to say. Daniel Craig, you know, he had to write, he had to write uh, Quantum of Solace and he did a bad job. I, we all had to sit through that. It was brutal. It was brutal. Let's see here. That's right, Dre Films. A lot of people are multi-hyphenates, so this certainly does affect them. But this is why you pay your dues. You know, the Writers Guild has the power to fight against AI, and only by all the writers not showing up for work and, and grinding the industry to a halt can they maybe get the agreements that they want. I would be concerned that they would still use AI anyway and not tell anybody. Um, but let's see. That makes me very nervous. KJ says, do you think we'll see shows fall like Glow did because of COVID? I fear for Cobra Kai's future. Um, I think there will be some casualties. I think, as I said at the beginning of the stream, some deals will go through. And I think it's just, um, look at you guys trying to fast forward. We'll boop in a second. 
And I, I think it's, um, you know, it's a complex situation, but I think this just has to be done. And I think they're, you know, don't worry. I mean, I think, you know, again, I think that summer's too crowded. I think they have a little bit of space to spread stuff out, and they do have some stuff, um, you know, backlogged. So I think it'll be okay. I don't think it'll be as bad as the pandemic break, but I, everyone I've spoken to thinks it'll last for a couple of months. So it might, it might last all summer because this is a lot of money that's being fought over. Uh, not only a lot of money being added, but they're trying to keep the, the industry from saving a tremendous amount of money. AI would save a tremendous amount of money. Hey, overcooked egg. Um, and they're worried about that as well. All right, so let's move on to the next. Hey, CJ, uh, JC, let's move on to the next story of the day. All right, hold on. Boop. All right, the story so many of you are interested in. Not only Margot Robbie for the Fantastic Four, but I'm getting updates. Let me just make sure I haven't gotten an update while I've been sitting here. Doesn't look like it. Okay, so I heard uh, a little bit before this stream that uh, the Fantastic Four cast has been fi finalized. I haven't been able to confirm who it is, uh, but I, I heard that it's most likely Adam Driver. Uh, and I would think that considering the proximity to yesterday's headline, it probably is Margot Robbie. Uh, I can't, can't confirm that, but I think it probably is Adam Driver and Margot Robbie. And we'll talk about that in a moment. And I'll, of course, make a video. Or if the news is really hot, I'll do a, like a, a, a specific live when the, when the news breaks. Uh, but also, uh, I, don't, I think Antonio Banderas is Galactus. I was like, why are we casting a serious actor as Galactus? This is ridiculous. Denzel Washington turned down Galactus. Um, he's actually in Gladiator, which we'll be talking about at the end of this uh, stream. And also, I heard they cast the thing, and they also cast Johnny Storm. Uh, I'll give you a couple of rumors that I heard, all right? So I did hear that they were considering Mila Kunis for either Sue Storm or The Thing. And that, you know, Seth Rogen is, you know, like their, their dream come true casting for The Thing. Uh, but, you know, they would go with Mila Kunis. I think to do that would, you know, you might as well not make the movie, quite frankly. Uh, so I hope that they do not do that. Uh, I would rather put She-Hulk in there and have The Thing be revealed at the end of the movie, quite frankly. Uh, I think they're facing a dilemma and that they want this to be somewhat diverse in some way, uh, but they're not quite sure how to do it uh, because I think, you know, there's that issue. Another thing that I heard of, a rumor, is that they might be casting an LGBT actor as Johnny Storm. I don't know if the character would be LGBT, but I heard that Lucas Gage from White Lotus at least tested for the role. Uh, I don't think he's very charismatic, and so I wouldn't like casting him for that reason. Uh, so... I'm not quite sure who, who it's going to be. Um, I heard that Paul Meskel passed, and he's very busy. He, he's very busy doing other things. He's doing Gladiator 2, which we're going to talk about at the end of the stream, and he just signed on for something else as well. So I don't think it's going to be Paul Meskel, so I think it's probably Adam Driver and Margot Robbie, and we'll see who the rest of the cast is. Uh, I don't think they'll announce it this week. Uh, I think they'll probably announce it maybe next week. Uh, I don't think they, I mean, if they finalized it now, it would be ridiculous to try and hold it until Comic-Con. I just don't think that you could. Uh, so I think maybe they'll do it next week. Uh, I, I can't imagine them announcing it at the same time that Guardians of the Galaxy cam comes out. That just seems ridiculous to me. Also, Little Mermaid, uh, the social media embargo lifts for that on Monday evening. So I don't think they want to overshadow that either. So maybe later next week, maybe later next week. But let's see. Let's see, maybe they have to, I think the offers have been accepted, so they're probably going to finalize the contract, so you have a little bit of time. Uh, so we'll see what they decide What they decide to do. Uh, so let's talk about, though, specifically Margot Robbie. So that's the T, that, that's everything I know about the Fantastic Forecast right now. I think, you know, Brett, I don't think they could wait till Comic-Con, but you might see them for the first time at Comic-Con, all four of them together. That would be quite the photo. That would be very cool. Uh, so let's talk about Margot Robbie specifically. Now, um, here I have the image here. Those are the actresses that I'd heard were in the running. I heard that Vanessa Kirby did not get it, which I feel bad about. I thought she was actually who I wanted. I'm surprised. You know, I think that the Fantastic Forecast went from being incredible to uh, nerve, a little bit uh, nerve-wracking nerve uh, almost immediately. Like, it went from you being like, oh, my God, it's perfect, to, oh, I don't know, hopefully it's good. Hopefully it's good. Uh, so that's a little bit uh, scary. 
So I heard for sure it's not Vanessa Kirby, uh, but I, we'll see who else, you know, maybe it's one of these actresses, but again, because of the close proximity to the Margot Robbie headline, it makes me feel like maybe it's her. Oh, she could have said no, and then they went to their second choice, and she said yes immediately. She was like, whew. So that, you know, that could be the case. I, can, I can't confirm who has been cast. I'm just telling you who it's most likely is. Um, so I do feel bad that these, are, you know, we're not getting other actresses having a shot. Uh, now, Brett says, does this mean that James Gunn lost Margot Robbie for Harley Quinn? You know, part of me wondered if James Gunn maybe did a last minute push for Margot Robbie at the Guardians of the Galaxy premiere on Thursday. He was hanging out with Kevin Feige a whole lot. He really thinks very highly of Margot Robbie. Maybe he realizes it's going to be quite some time before he can bring her back. Uh, and, you know, obviously everyone's very excited about Lady Gaga in the Harley Quinn role and the upcoming Joker, too. So maybe he pushed her for um, Fantastic Four. No, I, I mean, I, wouldn't, I haven't heard that, but I think it's a theory that, you know, I think holds water. I will say she looks the part, and I do think she's a very good actress. But, uh, and also I think, you know, I'm very curious about Sue Storm. It's not a great role, to be honest with you. Even in the comics, she is a wife and mother, largely. She's largely defined by her roles instead of Sue Storm herself. Uh, and she literally turns invisible. She literally turns invisible. That's not Lake Bell Ulk, that's Allison Williams. But I do think that maybe conservative audiences who are having a lot of muscle at the box office these days, they could maybe really get behind Sue Storm, right? Um, which, and I would have mixed feelings about that. I would love to see a popular female character, but yet at the same time, I wouldn't want to see her promoting, uh, you know, women taking a back seat. I'd be like, what? Uh, I'm not happy about this at all. Uh, but then, of course, she's also famous for having at least a flirtation with Namor, uh, who, of course, now is played by Tina Huerta. And recently they have, as you know, Mish pointed out, recently they've done a wonderful job showing how powerful Sue Storm really can be with her powers. However, when she uses them, she's a lot of the time invisible. And that's a weird role for an actress to take. You know, it's like, ah, what's your power? We don't see you. And you're like, run that by me again. <laughs> so funny. But we've seen a lot of Margot Robbie. You guys want a poll? I'll give you a poll. Hold on. All right. What do you think of Margot Robbie for Sue Storm? Love it. Too many big roles. I'll say with respect. Because, you know, I'm not, I, I'm not wanna, I'll talk about that in a moment. And then, uh, with, you know, she's just not right for role. All right, there are your choices. Okay. Uh, so here's the thing. She's already been Harley Quinn, and that has not performed well, with the exception of the very first Suicide Squad movie. Did not do well. Not, Birds of Prey didn't do well. The Suicide Squad didn't do well. Then with Barbie, I gotta tell you, while Barbie's trending, I don't really know if it's trending for Margot Robbie. I think Ryan Gosling's really driving that. And I gotta tell you, when Barbie comes out, Barbie's gonna be extremely controversial, unless they made significant changes. Although one of you told me you're starting to see that emerge from additional test screenings. So Barbie, I mean, and that's the other thing that worries me. Margot Robbie tends to really pick bad projects. Like she's like, ooh, cool, I like what you did with this. And we're all like, we hate what you did with this. You know, so I think that's a little bit scary too. I'm like, wow, if Margot Robbie likes this, it might be bad. So, and also she does, she's not selling tickets. Babylon was a flop. And, you know, I know, a lot of people were like, why are you just blaming Margot Robbie for Babylon? Well, how about the fact that Amsterdam also flopped? Two back-to-back -back movies that flopped that she was in. So she is, becomes a common denominator. So even though I think she does look just like Sue Storm, I, I, I can't ignore all these other problems. She's too many other big characters. I, I mean, I don't think there's anybody, any, even a male actor, that has been the lead in so many franchises simultaneously. It's really weird, because she still would technically be Harley Quinn, because, you know, I think James Gunn probably wants to keep her, and she'd still technically be Barbie. So you're like, what is happening? And, and there are so many other great actresses that could play the role, that it's kind of weird. You're like, why are we just picking one actress who has even not even been able to prove that she's a box office draw? 
So that to me is very odd. Luke says Margot Robbie is way overexposed and she's not right for the role. I can name 10 actresses that would be much better for it. Well, I agree with that. No, that's my other issue with it. I think that Margot Robbie is just lazy casting for Sue Storm. She's gorgeous. She has that wholesome girl next door look. She has the wife and mother thing down pat. Sure. But I think that there are other actresses like Vanessa Kirby or Jodie Comer or Allison Williams in particular, who I think would add a really interesting dynamic to Sue Storm and would make the character pop more than she has in the past. But again, maybe some fans don't want her to pop. Maybe some fans just want her to stay, you know, the nice wife who, you know, wishes Reed was more attentive and has like a, a forbidden flirtation with uh, Tina Huerta. So uh, I don't know. I mean, let's see. Maybe it would do very well. Maybe you would have all these people saying, oh, I love how the Fantastic Four is not woke. And the rest of us will be like, I'm trying to enjoy this. Don't ruin it for me. So we'll see. Toon Dude 19 says, Rachel Zegler keeps booking big roles and she flops a lot. Well, I think Hunger Games is her last shot. Uh, and Snow White. I don't think that she's going to book anything after this. Because, um, you know, I think it, it's been bad. So I think people are going to wait to see how these other projects do. Um... C.F. Williams says, Hi, Grace. Part of the MCU is Allura's exciting the fans with talented second-tier actors and actresses. This really highlights the increased pressure on Kevin Feige to go bigger. That's true. Like, when you think of the people that he picked, they were either down on their luck in the beginning or we'd never heard of them before. And that was really exciting. So I liked that. I, li I agree. You know, like, you know, you, Kevin Feige was a star maker. He wasn't riding coattails. And so to see him suddenly ride coattails is a little jarring. You're like, you don't need a big name. You're the big name, man. You don't need that. Also, uh, I'm nervous because for a minute we thought the fantastic forecasting was going to be perfect. And now I'm like, uh-oh. Like, I'm, more, I'm really worried about X-Men, which is naturally progressive, by the way. And so I'm hoping, I'm like, I'm like, if he's playing this much with the Fantastic Four, I'm like, you know what? If you never got to the X-Men, I might be okay with that. <laughs> because it's not good. Um, Nova Star, oh, I can see you're a big Invisible Woman fan. Even down to your avatar, you want a Disney Plus Invisible Woman spy series. I read that comic. It was only okay, I'm afraid. But it was a good idea. Uh, someone said, Bayef says, I need a break from Margot Robbie. You know, it reminds me a little bit of Jennifer Lawrence, who, of course, went on to be Mystique and annoyed everybody because people were like, too much, too much Jennifer Lawrence. And she doesn't even want to be there. So, um, yeah, I, I agree. I think it's also a little bit like Dwayne Johnson. It's just too much. I think people are going to see, that's the other thing. People are going to see Margot Robbie. They're not going to see MCU Sue Storm, which I think is uh, not great. That's the thing. Adam Driver, to me, was a great choice when he was next to Vanessa Kirby. Next to Margot Robbie, again, it starts to seem more like a Saturday Night Live sketch or like when they had John Krasinski as Reed Richards. That's what makes me a little bit nervous. All right, so let me end the poll here. Uh, let's see here. 43% um, say, with respect, too many big roles. 29% love it. And then 26% say she's just not right for the role. So... That's 70%. Like 70% don't like it. And that's not good, you know? And I, again, I feel like Marvel has to be careful. I don't want Marvel to fall for the same trap that DC used to fall for all the time. They were like, the internet loves it. And we were like, the internet, where are they? Oh, I forgot to put that in my notes. I see a lot of fans for Margot Robbie online. Where the heck are you when she has a movie? I mean, either you're a very small but vocal group or you're not putting your money where your mouth is. I mean, based on the way people react to Margot Robbie online, you would think that this thing would be, her movies would be huge, but yet you guys don't go. So I'd be like, no, I don't think it's bots, stray films. I think that it's just very organized fandom. And I think a lot of it is the same DC fandom, in fact, who, who fell in love with her as, Margo, as, um, as Harley Quinn. So, I mean, let's see. Derek B says, don't like when they take actors who have other projects instead of promoting underused talent who can use it. Like, that's the thing. Like, imagine how discouraging this is for Jodie Comer and Vanessa Kirby and Allison Williams. Maybe not so much for Mila Kunis. Uh, you know, like, when are they ever going to get their shot? Like, Margot Robbie is on her third shot. And, she, I mean, so far, she's zero for one. You know, she didn't make Harley Quinn work. Uh, we'll see how Barbie turns out, although I don't have high hopes considering how progressive and political the film is. And then she's getting a third? 
you're like, why not give somebody else a chance and see what they can do? Oh, let's see here. Thank you, um, Abhishek. That's very kind of you. I appreciate that. All right, does anybody have any questions or comments about the Fantastic Four? John Teal says, just bring back Jessica Alba. I've saw some people say I'd rather have Jessica Alba back, and I kind of agree with that as well. Uh, Lawson says, I think they, a key to a good Sue Storm would be to make sure the character is written from the female gaze. Uh, gaze, G-A-Z-E. I feel that if the writing is great, Margot will be great. Yeah, Margot Robbie is a great actress, but again, I think I'm going to see Margot Robbie and not Sue Storm. But no matter who's playing the role, I would agree you know, it was funny when I was watching Peter Pan and Wendy, and Wendy had to explain the perspective of mothers as people to everybody else. And I was like, so often women have to find ourselves doing that. And we don't want to do that. We just want to be part of the group. But we're like, fine, I'll explain how women have feelings and thoughts. I'll do it. And, uh, you know, it's getting old that we have to keep doing it. But I, I really would hope that, yeah, I would not want Sue Storm to be this Stepford wife. And I wonder if the press would have the guts to call it out because I see a press forgiving a lot of stuff in fanfare because they don't want to fight with fans. I'll call it out. I'll, I'll fight with people, as you know. I'll do it. I'm not afraid. I'll be like, that's a Stepford wife. Uh, and uh, I'm sure I'll have to deal with a lot of crap online for saying it, but I'll do it. Let's see here. Oh, Katie Lady says, uh, what did Toon Dude say? Let me go find it. I can't take forever to look for it, so let me see if I can find it quickly. Oh, Mario, I missed this. That, truthfully, as a fan of the Omega Storm, I'm afraid they're going to butcher everything X-Men. Yeah, me too, Mario. I'm really nervous about it. I'm scared. I don't see Toon Dude's comment, but I'm glad that people thought it was good. All right, let's see here. Uh, Blair Wraith says, why are they trying to look for a female option for the thing? Or was that just a rumor? They were. I think they're worried about, you know, it not being progressive enough. And I think they're worried, understandably, about some people saying this doesn't interest me because I don't see myself represented in that, which some of you have said about Indiana Jones, which I, makes me very nervous for that. Uh, so, uh, oh, tw Toon Dude said Twitter isn't the world. That's true. A lot of you like to say that. Twitter is important, but it's not the only thing. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't dismiss Twitter, but I, I wouldn't take all my cues from Twitter either. Uh, so, but anyway, I think that they're nervous about the Fantastic Four maybe not seeming progressive enough. So that's why I think they're flirting with some of these ideas. Uh, but I, I don't think that the Fantastic, I think there are other ways to do it. Um, I shall meet you at the monorail. Says, does Robbie even have the range to play boring? What do you mean? I can't understand if that's an insult, insult or not. <laughs> I don't want to insult Margot Robbie. As I've said before, I think she's a very good actress, and I think she's very personable, and I think she's gorgeous. But I do think the audience is... I mean, it's, just, it's like Ryan Gosling, which is why it's funny. They're Barbie and Ken. The world has decided they don't like Ryan Gosling very much, even though I think he's a delight. So I'm worried about this Barbie movie, to be honest with you. Uh, Sarah says, is, was Amanda ever in the running? What do you think about, uh, why do you think it is about Margot that has the studio choosing her? Uh, though I personally love the choice. I never heard Amanda say Freed, although I agreed that she was a good idea. Uh, just because I didn't hear it doesn't mean that she wasn't in the running, uh, but I never heard it, to be fair, to be honest with you. Uh, I think that Margot Robbie, I think they're nervous. I think Marvel's starting to get nervous, and I think they want someone who they feel can sell tickets. And social media and Margot Robbie's management team and maybe James Gunn have convinced Kevin Feige, potentially, that Margot Robbie can sell tickets when that's in fact not true. But she certainly can generate chatter. But I feel, you know, when I reported that Vanessa Kirby was a front runner, that did amazing uh, social media chatter. And I feel bad for Vanessa Kirby. She was who I wanted to have the part. Uh, let's see here. Michael Lucas said it used to be to have one famous actor for gravitas, like Marlon Brando and Superman. You don't even need that. I don't like that. I don't like seeing, you know, when Robert Redford kind of walked in the background of Winter Soldier, I was like, you don't need Robert Redford. Have more, have more self-respect comic book genre. Uh, John Teal says, I have a wild idea. Forget about being progressive and just make a good movie. Well, I think messages are important. I think messages are important. I wouldn't want to have message-free movies, but don't lose sight of that you're primarily making something that's supposed to be entertainment, particularly if it's a summer movie about Barbie. 
Uh, hey, lukewarm. That's a funny name. All right, let me go see Finn. Let me go see your comment, your thing. Uh, your little brother Gabriel says, Sue Storm needs to be a girl next door type, and this casting is the equivalent of Halle Berry cast as Storm. Oh, that's interesting. People were excited about Halle Berry as Storm, weren't they, initially? Although I don't think that really worked out. But you're right. I think trying to get a star for Storm led to them, in my opinion, with all due respect to Halle Berry, not casting someone who was actually right for the role. Finn, I'm trying to find it. Uh, Schlock says, Krasinski or no Krasinski, Emily would have been great. You know, I think there's a bit of ageism going on there, just like I feel like um, uh, Charlie Theron should have been Captain Marvel, and I think it's unfortunate. Oh, hey, Winter says, it's so much more exciting to see an actor get a big role who has a lot of buzz but hasn't gotten a big project yet. We all love an underdog, and Margot isn't exactly an underdog in the industry. You know, when she was cast as Barbie, I think that was okay because she so is like Barbie, and I think there, nobody knows what to expect from Barbie. But I do feel that if she takes this role, she will cross the line, just like The Rock did, where people start to feel it's unfair. So that's why I said I hope she turns it down, because I think some people will, some fandoms will turn on her, potentially. Uh, hey, Arthur. Finn, where is your comment? Finn, you might be too far back. Joshua Olin says, geez, what do I have to do to get Yvonne Strahovski or Rosamund Pike in for one of these roles? I think they're too far gone. I wouldn't cast them either. Uh, Sean Turner says, the nephew from White Lotus season two for Johnny Storm. Um, you mean like the guy who turned out not to be the nephew? Maybe. I haven't heard him. I heard White Lotus season one, Lucas Gage was being considered. Uh, Finn, I don't see your comment here. I don't see it, Finn. Finn, it disappeared. I'm sorry. If you write it when we're not in the Q&A section, you I'm sorry, sometimes you take your chances. Uh, all right. Oh, Co oh yes, you, you're right, Coke. I apologize for mispronouncing that. I'm sorry. Uh, Adam DeMarco? I, I don't know. I don't think Adam DeMarco would be a good Johnny Storm. Remember, he has to fit with, um, he has to fit with, uh, Tom Holland, because they're supposed to be good pals. All right, so let's go on to the next story of the day, and then we'll go to the Q&A where you can ask me anything that you would like. So we'll see. Let me just see if I have any more updates from any of my sources while we've been talking. Nope. Nope, 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 nope. Okay. Okay. I hope they don't release it this week. I'm making Guardians of the Galaxy content. I don't have time to cover freaking Fantastic Four right now, man. All right. Third story of the day. All right, this is a fun one. All right. Boom, baby. Gladiator 2. At first, this seemed like a stupid idea to me, but it's starting to seem pretty amazing. All right, so Pedro Pascal is the latest cast member to join Gladiator. Wow, what a blow up. What a glow up for his career. That's right. It's daddy, uh, art lover. Uh, that's amazing. And he, by the way, has become quite the fashion plate. Uh, I have some pictures to share because I'm so impressed. There he is with rocking shorts at the uh, Met Gala last night. He arrived a little bit late. Uh, I saw some, uh, some actors were staying at the Pierre. Some talent was staying at the Pierre Hotel and traffic. I was actually near there yesterday. And traffic up the Pierre, up, up Madison, was so difficult. That's probably why it took him so long to get there. But I think he looks great. He looks so happy to be there. Uh, I love his bold fashion choices. Uh, and, you know, he's really making a name for himself. You know, a lot, a lot of uh, male uh, talent is able to make a name for themselves in this space. Uh, you know, I think with, like, as a serious fashionista. Sometimes it come, becomes, like, stunt stuff. Uh, I think he's, I think he's doing better than Jared Leto, quite frankly. Uh, and Ezra Miller, uh, before they had their issues, also was a little stunty in terms of the fashion choices that were being made. But, you know, Pedro Pascal's just well-dressed. I think he's giving the ladies a run for their money. Uh, and then also I, I had another fashion sh uh, photo I wanted to share with you, which I thought was particularly good. Uh, where is that? Um... Here he is. Here he is at the FYC event for The Last of Us. And I'm like, is that pajamas? Is he wearing pajamas? But I think it works. He's got my glasses on there. He looks great. Uh, but I think that looks really good. So he basically wore pajamas to this event, but he made it work. 
Uh, so anyway, I love that. I'm like, oh, he's, I think he's even more stylish than Jeff Goldblum, Jerome. Uh, I think he's really becoming a fashion plate, which is great. That's going to help him. People are going to be like, where's Pedro? What's he wearing? I need a photo. Uh, that's right. Very daddy. Uh, all right. So whoever his um, stylist is, they're doing a phenomenal job. Phenomenal job. So what a, what a glow up, right? He's done uh, The Mandalorian. We went from not showing his face to being the star of the runway. <laughs> I love that. I love that for him. Uh, and he recently said he'd love to be Mando forever, even when he no longer fits in the suit, because all he has to do now is to provide a voice. Talk about job security. And then also, of course, The Last of Us. And he just signed on to do Gladiator 2 right before they start uh, The Last of Us Season 2. So he's, uh, he's really, he's booked and busy. He is booked and busy. Now, before, just recently, his movies were not doing well. In fact, he, he was the kiss of death for movies. So I'm really happy to see him turn things around so much and now to be in Gladiator. I'm not quite sure who's writing it, Talon. I know Ridley Scott's partially involved in the writing at the very least. I hope it's well written. We're going to talk about Ridley Scott a little bit in a minute, but let's talk about first the cast. So Gladiator is just a huge break for him. He's really leveling up here. He's going to be in a Ridley Scott-directed movie, which still means something, shockingly. As I said, we're going to go over Ridley Scott's career. Uh, his role is under wraps, but I think, you know, this just shows the versatility that he's perfected. He could be like a member of the Roman court, right? Like Game of Thrones, like his character there. He could also be one of the gladiators because he's so tough in uh, The Last of Us and Mandalorian. So I think he could do a really wonderful job. So I would love to see him be like a really hedonistic member of the court because I think he's already done the rough, st the rough guy, daddyator. Be Michael, that's hilarious. I love it, daddyator. Uh, but I think I'd love to see him, you know, this, this, this role that he's embracing on the red carpet, more flamboyant, a fashion plate. I'd love to see him do that in a role right? To show a little bit more versatility as an actor. Like I think the stoic zaddy thing, he has, he's already done that. He's in the dad. He's done the dad. He's done, uh, you know, the dad in the Mandalorian, the dad in, um, uh, the last of us. So I'd like to see him go back to, the, you, know, you know, doing this maybe a little more flirty stuff that he's been doing to, on the press tour, right? Let's, let's see that. Uh, so then, so, uh, so let's see what he ends up doing. He also has, by the way, that short film that will be, I believe, at Cannes, debuting at Cannes. He has an LGBT short film by Pedro Almod Al 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 Almodovar, which called Strange Way of Life, where he plays an LGBT cowboy with Ethan Hawke. Uh, it's very like uh, Douglas Sirk. It's very, um, you know, throwback. And the, the, the trailer, it was an extended preview came out and it was like very cheesy, but I think intentionally so. And I think it does maybe reference Rock Hudson, who of course was closeted uh, and was a huge star uh, and then went on, you know, to eventually reveal that he was not only LGBT, but he uh, tragically died of AIDS. He was one of the first back, uh, big stars to, to have that happen. Uh, so Pedro Pascal has some very interesting things coming up. Now, as for this Gladiator movie, Paul Meskel, he will not be uh, Johnny Storm, apparently. You know, never say never until they announce the cast. But everybody's saying, from what I've heard and other scoopers are hearing, is that he passed. So Paul Meskel will star. He will star as Lucius, Connie Nielsen's son. Some of you are asking, are there any women in this movie? Connie Nielsen is back. Connie Nielsen is back. Uh, this is her son, all grown up, nephew of Joaquin Phoenix's character. So I wonder if they'll present the other side of the equation. You know, uh, you know. So we'll see what they decide to do. Barry Keegan also stars. Joseph Quinn from Stranger Things. Joe Keery is like, how did I get leapfrog, man? But I think Joseph Quinn is just an incredible choice for this. This is very exciting. Uh, Eddie from Stranger Things, uh, and then Denzel Washington. Denzel Washington in a role that was apparently written specifically for him. And uh, when Ridley Scott presented it to him, uh, Denzel Washington said, let's do this. So this is a big deal for, uh, for Ridley Scott. So I have Ridley Scott's resume. Oh, look at this. Here's the resume. All right. So this is his filmography. And you can see he's actually been in a little bit of a difficult situation. The last really big film that he made that was well-received I think was Black Hawk Down in 2001. Oh my God, it's been over 20 years. I mean, he certainly made some things that are okay, okay? 
Uh, Coke, I haven't heard anything about Meryl Streep in Gladiator 2. I mean, I was just researching it before the, I mean, I might have missed it, but I, I think it surely would have been mentioned in the Pedro Pascal coverage. Uh, so anyway, she's in, the, uh, she's in, um, uh, she's in uh, Only Murders in the Building Season 3, thank you very much. The Martian was outstanding. I loved The Martian, uh, but I don't think that it was to the level of Gladiator, right? So The Martian was, I think, a rare bright spot. But I think that, you know, while some of you might point to some of these movies on the list and say that you liked it, uh, it certainly wasn't the level of Gladiator or uh, Blade Runner or Alien or Thelma and Louise. You know, it's just not that kind of stuff. Uh, so this is a big deal for him to try and, re re you know, uh, get his former glory, to get his former glory to go back to Gladiator with a Gladiator 2. American Gangster was decent. Um... And, you know, that's why Denzel Washington, he was able to get that, he was, you know, Ridley Scott was able to get that get. Uh, however, he has one interesting movie coming up. We'll see how it turns out. And that's Napoleon. Look at that photo of uh, Joaquin Phoenix's Napoleon. That's pretty cool. They showed an extended battle sequence of this at CinemaCon, which uh, apparently was not bad. Uh, but, you know, that looks cool to me. Uh, I don't really know if we're going to celebrate Napoleon now. <laughs> I mean, Napoleon was a, a cool historical figure, but he was banished to an island for a reason. Uh, but, you know, I, that is a cool photo. I mean, that's a great photo. That's really cool. Uh, so, you know, maybe we're going to see the return of Ridley Scott. You know, uh, Napoleon and Gladiator 2 back-to-back -back could be pretty awesome. I like Napoleon Ice Cream 2, Cosmics. Uh, Napoleon is my... Napoleon and Rocky Road. When I do eat ice cream, which is never, but that's the ice cream that I do enjoy. Does anybody have any questions about Pedro Pascal on this before we get to the Q&A? Da, 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 uh, Four-dimensional. I'm not saying Napoleon hasn't been cool, but I don't really know if people should be like, oh, Vanessa, uh, I mean, Napoleon is great. That's right, Vanessa Kirby is in Napoleon. She plays Josephine. If only she could have gotten some of that footage to Feige. Emmett Wright says, I know you didn't like House of Gucci, Grace. I didn't like the last third of it. I thought the beginning was excellent. But it wasn't a, it was a bomb, though, Emmett. Uh, and it got some good press reviews and awards noms. No, it didn't. It didn't, you know? I mean, that movie did not deliver. Uh, although Adam Driver and Lady Gaga, thankfully, both continue to work. Was Gaga losing the Oscar nom what rewrote that story as a... F I think, you know, also, it just, you know... Audiences turned on it. It did not have a lot of people supporting it on social media. I think the box office was not phenomenal. Uh, you know, it shouldn't, it didn't deliver like a movie like that should, quite frankly. Mr. Andrew says, when is this movie supposed to be released? Well, it hasn't filmed yet. So, it, you know, Napoleon comes out later this year for Thanksgiving. So this maybe maybe you know Gladiator maybe summer next year or a holiday season if they feel because you know the original Gladiator remember Elizabeth Taylor the the infamous Gladiator for Best Picture so you know maybe they're they're aiming for that Tay that's funny Margot Robbie is not in Gladiator too but you know maybe maybe that's pretty funny Jason Acker says I've always wondered how much Tony's death affected Ridley Scott since they work so much together oh that's you know quite sad his brother Tony Scott of course uh, I believe committed you know, took his own life. Um, I'm sure it was, it did affect him. Edward says, does Pedro Pascal run the risk of being oversaturated? I don't think so, particularly if he has a different type of role here. If he's playing a gladiator who's basically just like Joel in ancient Rome, then I think it could be maybe problematic. But if he does something a little different, I think it could be exciting, quite frankly. I don't think that he's quite at oversaturation just yet. I think he's still on his way up. So this still counts as exciting. And also, I'd like to point out that he's not in a major franchise. You know, Gladiator is a very famous movie, of course, but, you know, Pedro Pascal didn't, like, just go and join DC. So people aren't like, whoa, wait a minute, he's in Star Wars, The Last of Us, and now, like, what, DC? Instead, he's joining a serious film, and I would, uh, I would have advised that for Margot Robbie instead of joining another franchise. I would think Margot Robbie should be, you know, what about her trying to win that Oscar? I guess although Amsterdam and Babylon worked out so poorly, maybe she's like, I've had enough of that. Oh, go, cool. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. I hope you're having a great day. 
Oh, that's right, Juan. Pedro Pascal was in DC. That's hilarious. I thought he did a great job. Uh, Luch Lucario, we're not quite at the Ask Me Anything yet. And then Jason says, do you like Tony Scott's work? I thought he was like Michael Bay with the soul. I like Michael Bay's work sometimes. I think they're both, they, well, Tony Scott was a talented director, and I think Michael Bay certainly serves his purpose. Dylan says, Pedro Pascal for Sue Storm. I think he'd kill it. Uh, let's see here. Ambulance was a good film, Jerome. Ambulance was great. The first 10 minutes were a little bit ridiculous, but after that, I was like, wow, this movie's amazing. Uh, all right, so let's go on to the Q&A section. So for 10 minutes, you can ask me anything that you would like about any subject matter. It's 324, so we'll go till 334. Dory Does Voices says, is Margot Robbie a rumor or is she confirmed? She's still a rumor. All I can say is that I heard she was offered the deal. And other scoopers have said she's already been offered and turned it down once. So they, they went back to her, maybe with more money. So maybe she said yes. But So I can't confirm that she ha definitely has the role, but I did hear that she did get the offer uh, yesterday. Anything? Nope, nope, still nothing, still nothing. Although Twitter's a little bit not working properly lately. Let's see here. What's the other question? William Wall Oh, William Wallace. I don't know if you ever saw The Good Wife or The Good Fight, but really Scott and his brother were executive producers on those shows, and they were both fantastic. I did not watch those shows, but I certainly respect them, and I realize how successful they were. Oh, Ghoul, Ghoul appreciated all your birthday wishes. Oh, that's great. I'm glad, I'm glad you're having a great day, and we could be a part of it. Thanks for making us a part of your birthday. Let's see here. Nameless Desire says, Grace, what would you prefer, to win Oscars or to have box office success? Well, you know, the ideal is to get both. Uh, but I think they're both good. You know, if you, when, you win, when you get a lot of money at the box office, suddenly you want to win Oscars, like Steven Spielberg or Christopher Nolan. And uh, once you win a lot of Oscars, you know, the blockbusters start coming around saying, add a little cachet to my movie. But, you know, it's always an either or. You know, you, ha you got to have one or the other to make it, to have your film make it in Hollywood. Nova Star, what did Nova Star say? It says, Sue to me holds a balance with standing with her family and standing on her own feet. Uh, that would be beautiful. I mean, I would certainly love that, but it would be weird in a uh, feminist society. I mean, let's see how that would, I mean, it's going to be tricky to pull off. Uh, and what do you think of Alyssa Sutherland as Jean Grey? She could be really good, although I think she has a good villainous quality. Well, although I guess there's a, I don't know, I don't know about Jean Grey. I would love to see her. Someone mentioned her for Mystique, and I think she'd be a little bit better at Mystique. Andrew says, will shows be renewed despite the writer's strike? I'm concerned that Ginny and Georgia hasn't been renewed after months despite its apparent success. They can't be renewed during the writer's strike because they can't make a deal with the writer, but I think that doesn't mean they're not going to be renewed. A popular show is a popular show. I mean, they just renewed The Diplomat right before the strike, so I wouldn't be too worried about Ginny and Georgia just yet, but you might have to wait a little bit to get the headline. Jay King says, watched Raising Arizona for the first time and loved it. Also, oh, yeah, I'm such a good movie. And are you enjoying this season of Barry? Yeah, I think this season of Barry is brilliant. Every Sunday night when I watch HBO, I'm like, wow. Uh, let's see here. Danny says, any news on Elizabeth Olsen's future in the MCU? Wanda stands are getting nervous. Well, as I said... Agatha Coven of Chaos is going to lead into the Children's Crusade, which, of course, is a Wanda storyline. Uh, but so let's see. Let's see how it goes. But I, I mean, I haven't heard anything new than what I've already s shared with you. Oh, John, enjoy Ambulance. You're going to have a great time. Stick with it for the first 10 to 15 minutes. Once they get to the bank robbery, it really takes off. B. Weeb says, Grace, do studios leak this kind of casting info to pressure actors? I don't think so. No. This stuff's not leaking. Studios leak to the trades. This is genuinely leaking. If you were seeing it in the trades, that would be a leak from the studio. JC says, please follow Warner, uh, Writers, Writers Guild of America for updates to combat misinformation. That's very noble of you, JC. Oh, look, Nail in the Fashion gifted five memberships. That's very generous. Thank you. And Aided Buffalo says the Fast X trailer. Oh, they dropped another trailer? Eh. 
Uh, Piano Man 1313 says, Grace, I recently lost a parent. Oh, I'm so sorry. And I want to tell you your videos help distract me and make me smile. Thank you. I'm so sorry for your loss, Piano Man, but I'm glad, I'm glad you're taking good mental care of yourself and staying healthy and trying to stay positive while you process that loss. And I'm glad that we can be here for you and take your mind off of it. So uh, I'm, again, my condolences and thank you for sharing your story. Ah, Piano Man, we love you. Let's see here. Uh, Solitude Stare says, as of right now, are you still confident that The Little Mermaid will be a billion dollar movie? I, I'm not confident, but I still think it's possible. Let me see the movie. I need to see the movie. Dancing Dog 60 says, could Margo leaving for Marvel open the door for Kaylee Cuoco? Perhaps, I don't think she, Kaylee Cuoco will ever be live action Harley. I just don't see it. Look at Whitney Adrian. Feminist society? Yeah, I think women like to think of themselves as people these days. Oh my God. Let's see here. Uh, Talon says, binge the first three episodes of Love and Death. Thanks for the recommendation. I'm so glad you're enjoying it. Great show. Great show. Zay says, hey, Grace, when do you get to see The Little Mermaid? Oh, I'll tell, I'll tell you. I'm seeing it soon. That's all I'll say. That's all I'll say. Dory Does Voices says that they feel like, uh, she, like Margot Robbie is too on the nose. Well, some people will love that. And I think that if she wasn't the other characters, I would be okay with her casting. I might even be excited about it. But she is the other characters. So that's it. Uh, Nail the Infusion says, Boop, thank you for being such a brave ally and great entertainer. Aw, just got my tax return, so here's a tip. Oh, I'm glad you got some money back. Hope you're all happy and hydrated. I am trying to be more hydrated. I'm cutting back on the sugar. I'm trying to be more hydrated. I'm, little, I'm like, drink 64 ounces of water a day. What? But I'm working on it. I'm like, that's so much water, man. Nikita says, Dune poster and trailer thoughts. I'll be covering that tomorrow. So I didn't even want to watch the teaser because I'm like, I'm just going to watch the trailer tomorrow. I don't need to see part of it now. Big League Chew says, I hear that there is a test screening for two versions of the Barbie movie and with one being a bit more appealing to the younger folks. I did not hear that rumor, but I'm glad they're doing that because one of them is not for children. Holden says, who would you pick for Johnny Storm in The Thing be? Well, I do like Seth Rogen, but I like Margot Robbie being a little too on the nose. I feel Seth Rogen's a little too on the nose. Again, it feels a little bit like an SNL sketch which makes me nervous. I like to think a little outside the box or discover new talent. Uh, but some people don't like that, so it's tough. You gotta you know, you got find the right line. Regenerator says, any tea on the last Airbender Netflix show? I haven't heard anything about that, but I know they're moving ahead aggressively with the animated movies from the Airbender people, which I'm very excited about. B. Michael says, what would you say to Dev Patel as Mr. Fantastic? Also just wanted to say I've been watching you since I was about 13. Oh, that's so great. So happy to finally participate. Me too, B. Michael. Thanks for sticking with me. Um, I think Dev Patel is great. Uh, but, you know, I think hopefully he'll find another role for himself. Uh, I think he would have been a nice choice. Uh, but I also, I do like Adam Driver. Yeah, Alice, I don't want teenagers for X-Men. I'm really scared they're going to do... Freaking teenage X-Men. I'm going to be like, what? I don't want that. Oh, Nir, your first live. Cheers from Tel Aviv. Hello. Let's see here. Von Tron says, hey, Grace, you and the community are internet gems. Thank you. Aw, I'm so glad you caught a live too. And what a nice thing to say about all of us. That's such a nice thing to say. Uh, Raphael says, what if we made Sue the ruthless scientist and read the loving parent? Um, I don't want to play around with Fantastic Four. I think we've already played around with Fantastic Four twice. I think let's just do a traditional Fantastic Four, but let's just be really careful with it. I'm kind of nervous. Oh, look at everybody wishing Piano Man condolences. You guys are really sweet. You guys are just sweethearts. Andrew, oh, Gareth gifted 10 memberships. Thank you, Gareth. Andrew says, I understand you were busy with Guardians of the Galaxy to cover, but what did you think of the Hunger Games trailer? Many fans were happy, but unfortunately, you were not, Andrew. I loved it, but I was like, I don't think they should hide all the singing. There's a ton of singing in that movie, and I think that they should not surprise people with that. Uh, I thought the trailer looked phenomenal, although I think they didn't do a good enough job letting people know that was President Snow as a younger person. Because uh, I showed the trailer to some people being like, look at this. 
And they were like, ah, uh, they were like, it looks okay. And I was like, oh, did you get that that was President Snow? And that's why he said that's the sound of snow falling. And they were like, oh, no, I didn't. That is cool. And I was like, trailer poorly cut. Trailer poorly cut. Juan says, you watched Evil Dead. You can easily watch uh, American Horror Story. Ah, uh, but that's more than one movie, though. I mean, a movie's a movie. I can't watch this stuff weekly, man. Din J. Cobb says, hey, Grace, will the strike delay the Batman 2? Hopefully not. Hopefully it's in pre-production already, and they can just work on that and casting it, hopefully. I'm really nervous about that Penguin show. It doesn't seem to have anything Batman-y in it at all. Lloyd Lester says, I just got in to have to say, what are your thoughts on this morning's Tony nominations? I didn't even see them trend. I was like, were there Tony nominations? I saw Bad Cinderella trending, and people think, saying it was going to get canceled because it didn't get any nominations. And I was like, I don't see Tony nominations trending. And I didn't see it on Deadline's page either. I looked briefly. I'll have to go back and check it out. Harlequin Dub says, I'm going to see Chevalier this afternoon. Any thoughts? I already know the score, which I love. Uh, no, I, I, that movie for some reason just hasn't really been able to connect with audiences. But I, I do hope that you enjoy it. Michael says, Grace, what did you think of Florence Pew, Pew Pew's shaved head last night? I thought it was good. You know, her fashion choices aren't the fashion choices that I would make, so it's hard for me to get excited about them, but I do respect them, and I still love her very much as an actress. And I defended her look in uh, Dune Part 2, and I'm excited to see her in the trailer tomorrow. Newswriter22 says, no question, but you got your diamond today. Yay! Happy anniversary to us. Oh, that's wonderful. I'm sure it looks real good on you, Newswriter22. Uh, and Drago says, hi, Grace. I was glad I was able to catch a live stream, and thank you and the BTT family for making my day. Ah, oh, you guys are so sweet. And then Michael Lukash says, what are the chances of Kieran Culkin getting an Emmy for Succession? I think it's low. I think it's probably um, uh, Jeremy Strong's year for Kendall. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Danny says, Grace, do you like the fan cams? Uh, I, I thought you were asking me something else, Danny. Uh, no, uh, I do like the fan cams that some of you make. It's, uh, I save all of them, actually, and I'm really honored, and they're very sweet, and you guys find great clips, and you guys do great work. I'm very impressed with your editing skills. Morgan Dorfer, I'm extremely excited about Heartstopper Season 2. I can't wait for it. I'm very excited. I will review. Thomas Hastings says, there's been a series of stabbings in the small town where my school is. Oh, oh no, Thomas. Thank you for having the stream and has helped keep my mind off of it. Well, I'm so glad also to be able to help you through a difficult time, Thomas. And please be careful. And, you know, that's very disconcerting. And please stay aware and be very careful. I hope they catch whoever did that. Let's see here. Anything else? Jason says, let's do a traditional Fantastic Four, but change Sue to be completely different from the original. I wouldn't make her completely different, but I would hope to define her beyond just how her relationships are to everybody else, not just wife, mother, and sister. You know? I, would, I, I don't want her to be the mom of the team. That would really make me angry. But, you know, some people would complain about it. I was upset that people were like, Wendy's supposed to be the mom of Peter Pan, you know, in that story. And I was like, I always hated that. Oh, yeah, Wade, why doesn't Alan Richson get anything? He's in Fast X, but he's, well, I don't, I, I wouldn't make him the thing. He should be something else. He would be a good Cyclops or something. I really like Alan Richson. Michael, did I miss your super chat? Let me go see this here. Oh, Smart Girl says, I just want to say, like everyone else, how great it is to be here. Oh, what a nice thing to say. You guys are so sweet. I love all you guys. Let's see here. Trying to find these things here. Michael. Grace, if it were up to you and you only, who would be your director's choice to make a live action movie of Miles Morales? Oh, uh, was it Shaka King, the guy who did um, Judas and the Black Messiah? He'd be great. Let's see here. Raphael says, what if they make Sue the, oh, we already got that one. Okay, great, hold on. Blair Wraith says, for someone who's thinking about going to film school for cinematography, do you have any tips or things I should know to make sure I put my best foot forward? Uh, also, I'm glad Alita is getting a sequel. I don't know if that's true. Last I saw some people were saying people, it was being discussed, but I haven't heard anything. The movie did not make a lot of money, so I would be surprised if they made a sequel, but never say never. 
Uh, for cinematography, make sure that you go to a good school that has connections in the industry. Like, for instance, I would go to USC, which is more of a trade school, than NYU, which is more of a, like, bon vivant art school. So I would try to go to USC or something in Los Angeles and really pay attention to your internship and trying to, you know, and, and you know, I would also write to the guild. Uh, write to your guild. Um, I forget which one cinematographers are under, so just Google it. And write to the guild and ask them for any uh, suggestions and connections and if they have any programs for up-and-coming talent. Lucas says, do you think the new Ray movie could explore more of her darker side? I would love that. I love that she's supposed to be a gray Jedi. I would think that would be wonderful. Emmett writes, as I know someone in Davis where the stabbings are taking place. Wow, I'm really scared because as a huge Scream fan, the stabbings remind me of that movie. Maybe another copycat. Uh, yeah, that's very disturbing. That's one of the things I didn't like about that movie. Being in New York, I was like, like we don't have enough problems here. I'm sorry to see it happening anywhere. Oh, what does Devon know? Says, I'm proud to be a Beyonder. Oh, that's very sweet of you. James, I'm not watching Sweet Tooth. I just haven't gotten to it. I'm, I watched an old Columbo. Somebody tweeted the opening shot of the very first Columbo, which was directed by Steven Spielberg, and it's actually on Peacock. And I have to tell you, it was a delight. I loved watching it, uh, and I have to say it was really fun and interesting, and um, I, I had a good time. You know, sometimes when I watch uh, superhero content, I feel like I should be working, so it's hard for me. So uh, watching older shows or stuff that has, like, it's dramas is easier for me to kind of turn my brain off. So I had a good time watching that. And if you have Peacock, I would recommend that you uh, check it out. I also, I have Peacock with some ads, and they actually had a good ad. And I, they had an ad for a sneaker company out of Hawaii, and I actually bought the sneakers. So it was a fascinating experience last night. I was watching Peacock with ads, and the ads were helpful. <clears throat> blew my mind. I was like, which of Peter Falk's eyes is not real? And I was having a good time. All right, Gareth, I will. And Stephen says, uh, careful about water. Over drinking, it can make you sick. I will, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you for that. Wade, you watch Columbo every Sunday? What a good idea. Although, aren't you watching HBO? But that's a good idea. I want to watch the rest of the Columbos. They have a lot of Columbos on Peacock. That thing ran for a very long time. Uh, and Juan Carlos says, USC, fight on. Also, I, uh, I was invited to the commencement of USC, and Feige is the speaker. Oh, that's great. Yeah, a lot of really big names went to USC. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Lewis Cook says, what is your favorite Betty Davis performance? Oh, so many. Uh, I love Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, of course, and then also... Um, uh, all About Eve. I mean, you can't go wrong with the Betty Davis movie, quite frankly. Dark Victory is a very good movie that she made. Randolph G. says, my niece made me watch 2015's Pan this weekend. Oh, that was tough. It was just okay. I'm sorry that you had to watch that. That was a tough movie to sit through. Wade says, Falk made Columbo quite aggressive in the first episode. He softened him for later ones. I was surprised he went to that woman's house and insisted to cook for her. I was like, this was not made today. You could not do that today. I know Juice says, how do you feel about Major's chances of staying as Kang? Well, let's see what happens. His court, first court appearance is on Monday. I have it on my planner for us to potentially discuss in the stream if anything happens. Danny says, what's your favorite little Debbie snack? Oatmeal cream pie, hands down. I haven't had one in such a long time, though, because they're not very good for you. But that's definitely my favorite snack from Little Debbie. What a funny question, Danny. All right, let me do shout-outs. Let me do shout-outs. It's getting pretty late. I ran way over because I love talking to you guys. All right, shout-outs. Where are you? What are you doing? What's going on? Dancing Dog 60 is all for cosmic brownies. I've seen those, but I've never had one, actually. Danny's in Chicago. Big League Chew says, I'm a little parched for a warm beverage. Uh, any tea? <laughs> I gave a lot of tea about Fantastic Four earlier. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Platinum Diva. Oh, it's always so nice to hear from you in Vegas. 8-Bit uh, Focus is studying the MCAT for the MCAT in a month. Oh, good luck. Break a leg. Michael Lukash says he has the day off and he's cleaning. That's very uh, conscientious of you. Good for you. Uh, Rodrigo is on the way to Costco. Oh, Sample City. Uh, Daniel Montalvo said, just finished eating Wingstop after my last class of the semester. Oh, so I guess you're celebrating? Fantastic. I love it. Evan Moore says, sitting in a coffee shop in Virginia 
might be moving to Pittsburgh in the summer for a job. Super excited. Oh, Evan, if you go to Pittsburgh, please DM me. I'll give you a bunch of stuff to do there. I love Pittsburgh. But that's exciting. Uh, Blair Wraith is in Virginia Beach playing Jedi Survivor. That Mark Hamill uh, advertisement for that was great. Jack is practicing his eyeliner in the UK. It's harder than I thought. It is hard. I still even have not mastered it. I have my excellent brush, which I have to reapply several times a day. Mac is great. I love Mac. I use uh, Black Track. I'll help you out, Jack. I use Black Track from um, Black Track. It's great. I have to get some more. But I've used a lot of it, as you can see. All right. Michael McKennis is filling out my expense reports from the New York City trip. Oh, I hope you had a good time, Michael. Uh, did you like that? Please let me know if you like the lunch place I recommended. Um, <clears throat> Mark says, this was an amazing stream. Aw, you're so nice. Sion says, I'm on my way to see a Guardians of the Galaxy fan screening in the UK. Awesome. I'm working on my spoiler review, which will go up on Thursday when it hits most uh, countries. Ivan says, prepping final details for my Star-Lord cosplay to go to the screening tomorrow. Oh, that's great, Ivan. Send me a photo. Uh, I hope I see it. Please make sure I see it. Leroy says, just found out I have a blanket that might be illegal. Uh-oh. That's some blanket, Leroy. Michael, did you like the lunch place? DM me. DM me and let me know. Oh, let's see here. Oh, Jose is heading to Orlando. Gonna be, you're going to be in Hollywood Studios for May the 4th. Oh, Jose, I'm very jealous. Cesar Coronado. Oh, it's so nice to hear from you. Getting my word count of the day from my novel, By the Pool. Oh, a word count? That's like taking your steps. What a clever idea. Bubbles Emporium says, had strawberry and elderflower tea in London while listening to tea during the live. Ooh, I like that. Thanks for the amazing live stream. My pleasure, Bubbles. That's a great name. Name. Coke, thanks for saying that. If you could leave a like, if you could leave a like and subscribe, it would be appreciated. I, it would mean a lot to me. I got to start saying that in my videos. Pastor Madeline, how you've been missed. I'm so glad. I see you on Twitter occasionally, but you're very much missed from the live stream, so I'm glad you said hi. Uh, Mike Drop says, I have a wedding decor business in Las Vegas, and I'm designing and buying stuff for our showroom studio, which we're planning to open this month. Oh, that's exciting, Mike Drop. I hope you drop the mic on it. Love it. Mr. Andrew says, thanks for the stream. When I saw yesterday's Margo news, I knew I had to catch today's stream. Greetings from Spain. Ah, that's awesome. That's great. Uh, what does Devon knows, wants to know, as I do, how a blanket could be illegal? Is it an electric blanket? Ah, uh, I love it. I love it. I love it. Uh, and then Mexican Nacho. Hey, Mexican Nacho. Hello, everyone. I'm at the cafeteria at work. Oh, I love a good cafeteria. I wish they weren't endangered. Cafeterias are great. And then Mandela Butterflies rock in a ruby, a member for four years. I love it. Emily Jackson, I've never microwaved the oatmeal pie. I always eat them when I'm out because I get them usually like from a vending machine or something. Uh, and Fabby says, eating a healthy salad on my lunch break. Good for you, Fabby. Salads can be delicious. While Nova Star is drinking a root beer float. Oh, it's great. It's great. All right, you guys, I had a lovely time with you. Uh, by the way, just so you have an idea, the live streams this week will probably be on Thursday and then early on Friday, like around noonish, noon or 1 o'clock. So that's probably what the streams are going to be the rest of this week. All right, everybody, I had a great time talking to you. As always, you're a delight, and I'll see you soon. And uh, look for my Dune trailer coverage tomorrow. Okay, everybody, bye. Bye-bye. It drops at noon, noon Eastern Standard Time. Okay, bye.